Hey everybody, uh, Dr. Rick here. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, just finished running some errands, I'm about to head home uh, and do the family thing. I've been going at it since about four this morning. I'm gonna cut it off, it's about 4.30 now. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I'm gonna pick up that laptop and do some things a little later on. Uh, number one, upload this video. But anyway, <clears throat> Earlier, I talked to you about the importance of mental health with black men and specifically highlighting a current story uh, that's circulating now about former NBA player Michael Beasley and uh, how that played out. And I hope that you watched that video, but also took the time to watch the interview with Michael Beasley to get a clear understanding of exactly what I was talking about. But my mind just kept going and my mind just kept wondering and I said man it's, it's more to this I want to talk about today I, I know it needs to be addressed and I've addressed it in writing consistently I've addressed it in my lectures but I, I, I want to take it and I want to take it to a, a, a place using lay terms that everybody can understand and hopefully really hit this thing home and before I do that I want to remind you that we are still in the midst of the fundraiser for Black Man Lead our Rite of Passage Initiative and our Wraparound Services for Young Black Males uh, all the way up to the age of 30 and, and, and beyond in some instances. But we need your support. We need you to click the link. Listen to me. We need you to click the link or give through the Cash App account for the organization. But we need you to support work that is going to show up in our communities because right now we are really hurting in our communities in so many ways that I can't even touch on it now. But anyway, show some love. Now, I talked about how it feels to be a man and not have a space where you could be human because everything is based on how successful you are specifically financially and you're judged based on that but nobody recognizes your humanity because you're expected to be a machine you're expected to carry the weight and it's unbelievable and excuse me of course it will start raining when i do this but and the, the weight is unbearable but it doesn't stop there because i want to talk about my sisters too your, your struggle is similar, but also unique because, again, you're expected to be strong in ways that nobody should ever have to be. You're expected to do the mysterious and the magic. That's why I've never supported the whole idea of black girl magic because what black girl magic normally references is some woman who has had to step out and do all the stuff she was supposed to be partnered with someone to do or have help in doing by herself. That's not healthy. That's not to be celebrated. Now, do we have the resilience? Do we have the, the, the push? Do we have the heart? We've proven that. We are the most resilient people in the world. But resilience comes at a price when it is never, ever released and relieved. And what I mean by that is, your resilience should get you to a place where you can celebrate. Your resilience should get you to a place where you can relax. Your resilience should get you to a place where you can uh, recognize the, the, the fruit of your labor. Your resilience is never meant to get you through generation after generation of survival. And that's where we're at. And we, we don't want to talk about the trauma because we've been gaslighted by statements like slavery was 150 years ago. And, 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 and how long are you going to blame slavery? I'm so tired of hearing about slavery. All that bull crap that they love to throw out there and gaslight because they actually know the truth. They've done the research. They're not stupid. You don't have to prove to them anything. You don't have to tell them anything. You don't have to show them anything. They know that if we have never had Illy, that the trauma is still present. They know that from a perspective of uh, social learning theory, uh, projected it down, they know that it happens genetically, especially through the process of epigenetics. That's why ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, are so relevant and important to understand that we are literally allowing traumatized people to traumatize the next generation. And it's happening epigenetically, it's happening environmentally, it's happening through social learning theory, and it's happening through re-injury. It's not like they've stopped harming us. So you've got all these different mechanisms pushing in, and we're then we're asking what, 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 what the question becomes. 
how relevant are my tears? Because as I stated uh, briefly in the first video, the tears of the black woman aren't, re aren't, aren't responded to in the same way that other tears of white women specifically and especially, but any other woman, any other woman can literally weaponize her tears. Any other woman in a situation can sit up and say, oh my God, look what they're doing to me and start crying and everybody runs to her rescue. It's automatically ingrained in us. Black people even do it. Black people have been conditioned to believe that the tears of a white woman, the distress of a white woman is more prevalent and more important than the distress of a black woman because the black white woman has been given a position of priority in society that 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 rep, I mean that uh, isn't challenged by anyone. One of the most dangerous things in the world. I tell people all the time. One of the most dangerous things in the world is a wep white woman who's willing to weaponize her whiteness. And one of the quickest ways for a white white woman to weaponize her whiteness is to start crying. She all of a sudden she starts it. She talks crap. She says a whole bunch of bull crap. In the moment that she's about to get checked, she starts crying. Uh, in the words of my, my man Pop, say, motherfuckers, what, what he actually says, niggas love to start, niggas love to scream peace after they start shit. Well, they love to scream peace and oh, help me and why and all the other stuff uh, after they started. And, and it works because everybody comes to their rescue. The question is why? Why don't we respond to the cries of our black women the way we respond to the cries of white women? Why doesn't the pain of black women register at the level of black? Black women are four times more likely to die during childbirth than white women. Why? Because medical personnel and med medical uh, medical personnel don't take their complaints of, uh, of pain and discomfort seriously. When a white woman says, this is hurting me and that's hurting me, they go figure out what's, what's happening and why. When a black woman says, this is hurting me or that's hurting me, they sit up and say, it's going to be okay. It's a part of the process. You'll be fine. That goes all the way back to uh, some of the uh, horrible uh, experiments that were done on black women during slavery. Where they didn't believe black women felt pain, so they were doing all kind of treacherous physical experiments on our, on our black women with no anesthesia. And the belief was they didn't feel pain. Uh, even Thomas Jefferson said that black people didn't have souls. And, and, and so there's this level of inhumane uh, engagement that no one wants to talk about. No one wants to admit. They don't want to talk about the macro and microaggressions that come along with this idea that somehow black people aren't as human as white people and therefore don't feel pain and are in some way more animalistic. And so we don't respond to their cries. We don't respond to their pain. We don't respond to their hurt. And it goes in the same, in the, in, in, in the same realm with black men. When a black man says he's hurting, when a black man says he's tired, he can't be tired. The black man, the moment a black man says he's tired, he's lazy, he's unpurposed. Uh, it, it, it never, ever, comes to the thought processes of people who are observing this person go through something that they may be at the point of breaking they're not allowed to break if they break they were soft they were weak they were evil when it happens to a white person he had a psychotic break when it happens to a black man he was the evilest person in the world he didn't have a right to have a psychotic break he didn't have a right to be on the edge he didn't have a right to not have uh, managed his childhood trauma well. He didn't have that right. You can get a serial killer, and they, they're still explaining Jeffrey Dahmer and, and John Wayne Gacy. They're still explaining the behavior of Ted Bundy and, 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 and so many other white serial killers. But when it came to, uh, God, what's Little's first name? But the guy, black guy named Little is, uh, by record, the most prolific serial killer of all. Uh, at least 99 deaths accounted over 30 something years. But he was the he was the epitome of evil. Why? Because he was more successful at it. He was doing the same thing they were doing. Y'all just didn't catch him. Well, y'all had him. Y'all kept letting him go. 
And he chose people that you didn't care about in society. Those people that you just write off and don't worry about. But the bottom line is, he was no different. Whatever level of evil you ascribe to them, you, uh, to him you must ascribe to them. Whatever level of uh, uh, an attempt to understand should also be granted to him. I'm not giving anybody a pass who harms anybody. What I'm saying is that as long as we're not judged on the same level, there's going to be a natural uh, transcription of that behavior to the idea, to the notion that we are as important as the others, that we don't matter. My question again is, why are our tears not felt with the gravity of anyone else? And I, I'm not trying to, in, 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 in the vein of, of, of explaining this, put myself in their place and want to be like them. I'm saying that we live in a culture where we need to start ourselves acknowledging the pain of our sisters. When, 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 when they're out there doing something, instead of giving it some magical name, call it what it is, they're struggling because we're not whole. They're out there being single parents. Because, but, you know, and, 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 it, it, and let's be real, it's men out there too. I myself was a single father. My children from my first marriage, I took. You know, I don't deserve no special praise for it, but I did it and I deserve the acknowledgement of the fact that I did it. I don't want nobody patting me on the back. I did what a man was supposed to do, but at the same time, I deserve it. I'm not one of those people that believe that if you're doing what you're supposed to do, nobody should, should acknowledge it. That's bullshit. We are built to thrive off of acknowledgement. We are built to thrive off of being affirmed. We are built to thrive off of that. But we've got the idea that when a black man does something he's supposed to do, don't say anything about it. He doesn't do What you're clapping for? What you applaud? Well, he's doing something. Nowhere. You go on a job and you do your job the way you're supposed to. You get an assessment at the end of the year. They give you a raise. They give you something. If you do it nicely, they even give you a plaque for doing what you're supposed to do well. Everywhere you go, you get acknowledged, except for being a black man doing what he's supposed to be doing. You get nothing for that. Now, I don't need it because I'm going to do it regardless. But let's be real. When you don't acknowledge that, where does a man stand? When does he get acknowledged? Because here, here's why I believe a man needs to be acknowledged. Because the idea is, you know, the idea when you say that is that he doesn't deserve to be acknowledged. I, I, I acknowledge women and men who do what they're supposed to be doing. If you're a mother and you're a good mother, I'm gonna acknowledge you because we need more of you because everybody's not a good mother, for one. Here's the second thing. When you sit up and say you, you don't deserve any special acknowledgement because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you are, you are implying that there's a level that you can get to that if you do that, then somebody should say something. But see, to me, any level I get to, I'm supposed to be doing. I'm doing what I can do at the capacity I'm doing that. So I'm always giving my best. So as I grow and I'm able to do more and give more, that's what I'm supposed to do. So I'm never ever doing what I'm not doing more than what I'm supposed to. Because the more I can do, the more I'm going to do because that's what I'm supposed to do. So at what point do you sit up and say, all right, that dude handling his business? At what point do you acknowledge that the weight of not having a space in this world weighs on a man? that not being, you know, there are a bunch of men. When I saw um, Michael Beasley, and I mentioned this in the first video, when I watched it and I saw the pain start to erupt, the first thing that came to mind was, I wonder when the, was the last time that he heard I love you without motives attached to it. I mean, outside of his young children, when is the last time he's heard I love you and it was simply because somebody cared? That, that's heavy, that's heavy. It's because you're searching and you're looking and you're needing something and it's not there. And you're looking for it. One of the things he told the guys was, man, I've been looking for good people for so long. Look, listen to what he said. I've been looking for good people for so long, I'm tired. I'm tired of looking. I'm tired of searching people with for good motives and, 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 and for goodness inside of them. I'm tired. 
like like uh, brother Jason Wilson says in his book a battle cry when a man tells you he's tired believe him we have so much animosity between us that we can't see what each other is going what, what each other is going through that has to stop there has to be some empathy and acknowledgement that we are both going through some things and our tears are ignored our pain is ignored and no one is acknowledging that we're human and that we need a space to express our humanity my challenge is that we move in a way that we start to develop that's why black man lead is so important because we're we're, we're socializing the next generation to be more than money makers. Yes, you need to own your own business. Yes, you need to be out there. Yes, you need to be providing for your family. But you also need to be able to feel. You need to be able to war in the streets and come home and be gentle with your wife and your kids. You gotta be able to change in, uh, who you are and be when you're out there going to work because going out there trying to get it is war. Going out there and trying to get it, you gotta be better than the people that don't look like you. You gotta be better, significantly better. But you got it and you can, but you're gonna be in a war mentality. You're going out there to get it. You're going out there to win. You come home, it's not a competition. You're not competing with your wife. You're not trying to dominate your children. But you gotta understand in order to be that whole, to be that exceptional, to be that remarkable as a man requires wholeness, healing, and a place where when things become overwhelming, he can openly acknowledge it to someone because it's going to happen. On the flip side, our sisters, they need to know <coughs> that they don't have to prove their strength through taking on more than they were designed to take on. They need to know that they can plug in to something and someone. That there are people out there that are gonna to come to their side. Sisters, if you know people who are out there, call them up, girl, I know you need a break. I I'm gonna come get the kids, you go do X, Y, Z or whatever it is. Go get your nails done, your pedicure, uh, whatever. Uh, you know, <clears throat> brothers, if she's got sons and the father isn't around, Hey, you know, I've been thinking about going here and I'm taking my boys. Uh, do you think, you know, <coughs> your son will want to go? We've got to become a community again. We've got to become a village again. That's my challenge to you. As I leave this place, I'm going to remind you one more time. Look, we need your support. Show some love. Click the link in the description box. And I know I'm out of here.